Science and Scriptures. Um, no, that's not what I wanted. What I wanted was this. this down so I can control it. Saturday. They say the full moon on Saturday that will be the biggest, I guess, the Halloween. Wow, this was special. 
And then send me their movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that always says no the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Christian science has the same problem that most of traditional Christianity has. As adherents of truth, we take the inspired word of God as our sufficient guide to eternal life. If the Bible is our sufficient guide to eternal life, why do we need science and health with key to the scriptures? Why do we need the Westminster Confession? Why do we need the uh, Council of Trent, the codicil? If the scripture, if the word of the Bible is our sufficient guide to eternal life, why do we need anything besides the Bible? Well, isn't that what they're saying? That in that their belief that they just... Their belief they is the that the Bible, Bible is our sufficient guide to eternal life, but right. it's not. In Christian science, you have to have the science and health with key to the scriptures to know how to understand the Bible. In church tradition, in classic Orthodox Christianity, you have to have the councils and the creeds to understand how to read the Bible. The Bible isn't sufficient. You have to have this guidance to the Bible. And without that guidance, you wouldn't end up where they say you should be necessarily. Because people who read just the Bible don't end up in Christian science. People who just read the Bible don't end up in any church necessarily that makes a big issue out of any number of, or even one major doctrine that is expressed within their particular tradition. Because a whole lot of other Christians who read the Bible, they didn't come to the same conclusion. If you don't have the Schofield Reference Bible, and that's a Bible with a whole lot of notes, so it isn't just the Bible. You're not going to end up as a dispensationalist. Uh, 1,800 years of Christians never ended up there, and millions of Christians since the first people figured out that that, in fact, is how you ought to understand it, have read the Bible and haven't come out there yet either. Even after they read some of the dispensational stuff, they didn't come out there. So we make a claim that we, in fact, do not live by. Uh, now, we're going to look at this one. This is their second major, this is on their website. We acknowledge and adore one supreme and infinite God. We acknowledge his son, one Christ, the Holy Spirit or divine comforter, and Man in God's image and likeness. 
Now, if you read that, just as I did, would you have any inkling as to whether or not there is a substantive difference between his son, the Holy Ghost, and man? And in fact, they don't. This is in the book, Science and Health and the Scriptures. This is in the chapter on creation. The theory of three persons in one God, a personal trinity or triunity, suggests polytheism. Does it? It may suggest it to you. That may be your interpretation of it. But the reality is that the doctrine of the Trinity was created in direct opposition to the idea that there are many gods. It's a doctrine created to maintain the doctrine of one God. And they came up with the expression in English of one God, one nature, three persons. But that was to deny polytheism, was to insist that the doctrine of one God is the teaching of the church. In line with Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, what's wrong with that? Expression. Where is that at? It's, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is the Shema that precedes the teach your children this when you walk in the way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Uh, the, the, the exact phrase is in three. Chapter three? No, no, chapter six. Verse three? No. Deuteronomy? It's four, verse four. Deuteronomy six, four. I see it. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yeah. And they word it slightly differently here. She does. But hers is as bad as English. Hers is even worse in terms of it being uh, sensible. What? What? One Lord. Yours says one Lord. And how is Lord spelled? Capital L-O-R-E. All caps. All caps. This one is not. This one is just as the capital L. Uh, the Lord our God is one. One. Yeah.
This becomes, by Jesus' day, by the first century, this is the preeminent verse of Judaism for monotheism. The Jews are adamant anti-polytheists by the first century. They are aggressively anti-polytheists using this verse. But the reality is this verse doesn't say that. And it's obvious when you look at the verse. Who is one? In this verse, who is one? Our God. Our God is one. Well, that's true of all gods. Baal is only one. Now, he may be one of many gods, but he's only one. And the Lord here, you see, in all caps in your text, is the name of God. Yahweh is one. Well, of course Yahweh is one. There's only one Yahweh. There may be other gods, but there's only one Yahweh. So to use this phrase as the proof that deity is singular is to misuse the verse because the verse doesn't say that. The verse doesn't say he's the only God. That's monotheism. Yahweh is one, yes, but Yahweh is the only Elohim. It's something entirely different. And this verse doesn't say that. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh alone. There may be other gods. That's immaterial. Yahweh is our God. Period. No further discussion. Whether he's alone or one of many, it doesn't make any difference. He's our God. We're his people. It doesn't make any difference what deity is. Now, there are plenty of other verses in the Bible that use the terminology of only, alone. So the, the monotheism of the Old Testament is solid. There isn't any question that while there are verses in the Old Testament that refer to the gods, there is a very clear understanding that whatever those creatures are, they aren't up with Yahweh. However real Baal and Ra and all those gods of the other uh, cultures may be, they don't rank with God. They're, they're so far in second place, they're not on the same racetrack. You know, they're, they're on the marathon, they're still out in the country somewhere, and he's already in the stadium uh, finishing the race. Uh, there are no comparison. And that is probably the implication of their word that they attach to God so many times, holy. The, in its basic use, it means different. And the, the, the fundamental early statements about God being holy was not a moral judgment, it was a nature judgment. God is holy, I mean, he's something else, he's different. Whatever else there may be, he's different from. I don't know what that may be, but he's, he's not any of this other stuff. Uh, and in that nature, he then becomes the sole deity. 
However, there may be mighty forces, personal or impersonal in the world, whatever they may be, nothing begins to rank with Yahweh. And so he's not just Israel's God, end of discussion, their only God. He's the only God there is. Period. Period. And clearly, the, New, the Old Testament uh, uh, sets that forth in numerous verses. There just nobody compares to me. You have those long passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah where, where God goes through a whole litany of differences between, uh, you know, who tells the future. I'm the only one who does that. Uh, and a whole bunch of things like that. He sets himself clearly apart from anything else in our imaginations. You imagine whatever you want, as powerful, as great, as mighty, as eternal, um, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient as you want, and you haven't gotten to God yet. Because he is above, beyond, anything that you can even conjure up in your imagination. And doesn't make any difference what a great science fiction writer you are. You still ain't got close to God. Uh, he's different. Uh, now let me go down here a little ways. Uh, a limitless mind, this is God, cannot proceed from physical limitations. A mind originating from finite or material source must be limited and finite. Infinite mind is the creator. And creation is the infinite image or idea emanating from his mind. If matter, so-called, is substance, then spirit, matter's unlikeness, must be a shadow. And shadow cannot produce substance. The theory that spirit is not the only substance and creator is pantheistic. If you believe that spirit is the only substance, the only reality, you have the truth. If you think spirit is not all there is, you're wrong. You're a pantheist. And that ultimates in sickness, sin, and death. It is the belief in a bodily soul, a material mind, a soul governed by the body and the mind in matter. This is shallow pantheism. This is their belief. This is what she wrote. This is Eddie. Yeah. This is her science and, and, and scriptures, science and health and scriptures. This is on their website. This is the book. I've just gone to chapter 10, whatever it is, on creation. I'm just going down through it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is what makes her so qualified to write this anyway? I mean, it, what's her credentials? I mean, is she just saying this is from God? Yeah. Giving her this message? Yeah. Well, see, that's, that's like Joseph Smith. Of course. Giving these messages. Absolutely. So she's, sounds like to me, she knows just enough to get in trouble, and she's not that bright. <laughs> 
and she's putting that down. It sounds like rambling, but maybe a drug hit. But I'm just saying, who cares? I mean, so she's writing all that. Some of them are buying into it, but most people, me included, I'm reading this. I'm going, I don't get it. Yes. So most people that follow her are probably like most religions. They like the people that are in it. Well, <laughs> to you it is, but to them it's not. That's the way any religion works. Well, that's just like the Mormons. We think it's crazy, but they're really buying into it. Of course. It. What I'm saying is, she's doing the same thing. Yes. Pretty smart shit getting all these people into it. Yes. And a lot of those rambling is what people can't understand. But what would you use besides more freedom? But why would you pick it out like that? Why would, I mean, why would you even go through that? I mean, I can see where it's all wrong and everything with most people. She's got a demon. Well, she does. Oh, I saw that in the school that she was real sick and then she had to take more than you want to get, you know. She was sick and so of many different things. Well, yeah. But th this and that's probably what she did. this work grows out of, according to the history, according to their claim, this uh, great bout she had with near fatal uh, uh, illness injury, uh, during which she was. Uh, deeply involved in meditation and Bible reading, oh, okay. and she comes to the understanding that God is love, God is spirit, uh, and this is the ultimate reality. And then she takes the further step that not only is it the ultimate reality, that it's the underlying reality as Christianity has uh, believed and everything else is contingent upon the fact that God created it, made it, and molds it, and so on and so forth, controls it, that it's the only reality. Well, to her, it is. That spirit, uh, finite man cannot be the image and the likeness of the infinite God. We read Genesis 1 and 2 together. And so we read, God said, let's make humanity in our image after our likeness. And so God did it. He made them in his likeness after his own image. And then the double words are used and the phrase is repeated. And then you get to chapter 2 and he takes the dirt from the ground. He forms man. He breathes into his knows the breath and man became a living image I mean, a living individual in the image of god now we maybe shouldn't read both of those verses together like that but that's the way we did so that we and that that gave us then this whole problem of well how much of our physical appearance mirrors god's image and then you see we can get into the whole gender issue, how male, female, all that kind of junk and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and she's reacting against this and insisting that our finite nature, if it really exists, can't possibly reflect the image or the likeness of an infinite God. So for you to think or to claim that something about this material person, this physical individual, in any way mirrors God is just false thinking. Because there's no way the material could image the immaterial. The finite could mirror the infinite. And of course, that's, a, that's just a flat, straightforward, uh, philosophical claim that there's no way you could prove because how do you know that the nature of the infinite God 
cannot be reflected in the image of a material man. Give me a piece of evidence that that may not, that that in fact is possible. Well, when Jesus was born, you know, he took man form. And Look at Hebrews chapter one. But um, when I think of God, Hebrews I chapter God, one. You know, I think that's what he did have. <laughs> I know God came. Jesus came. He who seen me has seen the Father. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers, to the prophets of many, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, yes. whom he appointed heir of all things. This Son, who is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Yeah, but that doesn't have to be a human form. Well, I don't know. It's with Jesus, but I mean with God. And, and I can't wrap my head around God being a person. <laughs> I, re I understand that, Nancy. And one of my problems with the idea that we have, that we develop these creeds that, that say he's one God in three persons is to place upon God a category of our human experience. And they may not work. And one of my concerns about that is, for instance, there are cultures where there is not all, there is hardly the idea of individualism. People don't think of themselves as an individual. They are a component part of a family, of a clan, of a tribe. And there's no sense that they on their own can make a decision, take responsibility for something. They, they, they don't even think that way. They have, so to say to them, well, God is one nature, but he's three persons. They're looking at you, scratching their head. What do you mean? What are you talking about? This is a creed that operates in a culture with a real sense of individual identity. But what happens if you don't have that culture? The Greeks had a very clear concept of individuality. And the Hebrew writer can say, in whatever way, the human Jesus is, by his humanity, different from God. He mirrors God in an incredibly close, exact way. That if you pay attention to Jesus and you accurately understand what you see and hear, you're not going to have an idea that's not true about God. And that's still hard for us to wrestle with. But see, she's so committed Here she gets a little bit closer. Man is more than a material form with a mind inside, which must escape in order to be mortal. Man reflects infinity, and this reflection is the true idea of God. Mortals have very imperfect sense of the spiritual man and the infinite range of his thought. To him belongs eternal life, never born, never dying. Now you see why they could affirm we acknowledge God, his son Jesus, 
his son, the Christ, the Holy Ghost, and mankind in his likeness. There's no distinction for them. We in our very nature are like the sun. Not just everlasting, but immortal. I.e., we had no beginning as well as no ending. That's what she says. Never born, never die. Well, was she going by, uh, obviously she's not talking about her body, but is she talking about like under her, her spirit? Her spirit being, which of course for her ultimately is all there is. This body is just a projection of your mind. Is a projection of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. That this material, there is no material. See, her first claim was spirit is all. On that spectrum of reality, she's on the far side that says everything is spirit. From the opposite end of everything is material to in the middle where there is both spiritual and material. And then you shade off as to of those two, which is the primary and which is the secondary. And then you run the gamut of a range in there There are, you see, a lot of, quote, materialists, atheists, agnostics, who would agree that we humans are more than just material. We have a consciousness. We have mind working. There's more here than, than just physical atoms flipping around in neurons in our brain. There's something more going on. And, and, and it's rooted in the material. And without the material, it would not exist. And once the material goes away, it will cease to exist too. But while it's here, there really is more than just matter. There's some kind of, call it what you want, some kind of ethereal spirit, spiritual, mental, psychic, there's something going on. And then there are people at the spirit end who are willing to grant that there is this temporary physical existence that we're put into often with the Hinduism, for instance, in a repeating series of experiences. But all this physical is pretty much kind of incidental. And if you really want to stop coming back, what you got to do is figure out how to discipline yourself so you reduce all the physical to its absolute, absolute minimum. Hence their extreme asceticism. You separate yourself from all the physical as far as you possibly can, both physically and more mentally, to where you have absolutely no interest in it, reliance upon it, need for it, in you know, you just you'd be just as happy if you didn't have it. I never heard that explanation. Yeah. Because I was wondering about that because I always thought they were trying to get a higher level to, you know, to the creator. No, what they're really trying to do is simply shed yeah, this this physical stuff that's interfering with our, our fundamental spiritual nature. Uh, but they do believe that the physical is here. They're not, they're not like her who's saying it doesn't even exist. It's just a projection of your mind. Although there are some Hindus that, that come pretty close to where she is in terms of, and, and therefore you see all the more, the, the solution is just control your thinking. 
All you got to do is meditate at the level and the depth that you become in fully in tune with your true spiritual nature. And then you understand that all this stuff is not, well, it may not even exist. It's just what you thought was there. Well, that's just your way of answering what's really going on. Does anybody really know? So when she's saying that, I mean, some people could buy into it or not. Because, I, I mean, to me, the whole thing is just amazing. So yes. who's, who's to say that we are just spiritual beings and everything? And so... Well, and the, and everything. So who knows? I mean, she just, I think they all tried to find an answer to what yes. they see, but no, trying to explain it. They're not going to find it, but we can't say it's wrong because she may be on to something the way yeah, I say it, or maybe she's not. Except that the Bible story clearly refutes that idea. The only thing though, so many people don't believe in the Bible. Or of course. And of course, if you don't believe in the Bible, then the Bible story is in, is insignificant to you. Uh, and then you're left to try to figure out. And so then you're open, you see, to what you find within yourself or what is revealed to you from without by some means, either intuitively or personally by some great guru of a previous generation or eon or the the god or the deity that exists and you become either the medium of revelation or you become the medium of discovery well how did you say she came about this what was she doing i have no idea how she came about this but notice her idea you see of our being our eternal being spirit is a whole lot like joseph smith in the dot so what time was all this this is all happening in the 1800s she's about 40 years or so behind joseph smith in chronology yeah she's late no she's later than he yeah He's, he, he's in the 1830s and 40s. She's in the 1870s and 80s. Well, uh, well we except that, that there, there's a lot of this thing floating around in the, in the community being promoted. You have these public discussions. You have these lectureships that are going on all over the place. Uh, these people expressing their opinions, the psychics, the prophets, uh, the, the, the woods is full of this. And here in this, just this one little snippet about our nature, you see, you see her saying basically the same thing that Joseph Smith says about our nature. And that's the distinctive feature of that story in Genesis. God takes matter, dirt, dust, clods of earth. He shapes it, and then he animates it. And it becomes a person, a distinct individual, not a spirit embodied in the material. Why not? He blew air into it. Yeah, but he blew he, he, he blew life into it. He blew, it, it. Yes, but it was not an individual. Right. It only became an individual in this merging, this integration of the physical and the spiritual. And he blew into it. Yeah. So that's confusing to me because okay, he created, he blew into it, and now we have a, a person. But uh, so he's he's blowing life into him, but he's not giving him the spirit, right? Well, see what you have. Yeah, yeah but and, and see the text doesn't say that. So he's just giving them life. But what is life? I mean, we're all I think spiritual beings if you have life. Yes. 
we have clearly we clearly have we still we clearly have in the biblical view a spiritual aspect a spiritual quality so one simple little text says the body returns to the earth from which it came and the spirit returns to the lord who gave it now remember you see it's easy for us in that translation to think of a conscious, thinking, spiritual being. Well, that's what we are. That's what we are. And so we can easily think that this verse is saying the earth, the body, the physical part returns to the earth and the spiritual part, the real me, returns to the Lord who made me. Wait a minute. But now, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Remember, in Hebrew, they only have one word. And sometimes we translate it wind, and sometimes we translate it breath, and sometimes we translate it spirit. Maybe the writer of that verse is simply reversing Genesis 2.26. The body returns to the dirt and the breath returns to the Lord who gave it. And so he's not saying anything more. Now that saying that, you see, doesn't deny that even that writer believed that we have a real spiritual identity that in fact uh, survives when our body dies. Doesn't say that. You, you don't know what that writer believes except that verse that he says. So you can't say, you can't use that verse to say, well, obviously they didn't believe in our spiritual identity that when we die, um, there is a spiritual aspect, quality, facet, element of us that continues to exist somewhere, somehow, in some form, with some degree of consciousness or in sleep or what, you know, whatever your theory may be. All that may be true, and the writer may have believed that. He's simply constructing a phrase that is the reverse of Genesis 2. Perfectly appropriate thing to say, because there are plenty of other thing, places where you get the expression, as you do repeatedly in the person dying, particularly the king, the, he he expires, some kind of phrase is used, and he went to be with his ancestors, his, in, in Hebrew and English, Old English, his father. So there was some consciousness, the, the Sheol, the pit of Old Testament mythology, of poetry, was something. They weren't very clear about what it was. But they were convinced that the Lord wasn't praised there, for one thing. But the writer of Psalm 119 believes even if he goes there, God's going to be around to be conscious of him. There's no place I can go to hide from you, Lord. Even if I go there, you're, 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 I can't get away from you. Uh, so they, they clearly have some sense of this identity. And the problem is that in, Christ, in Christian history, we ultimately develop this full-blown idea that we are significantly, if not principally, a spiritual being somewhat temporarily housed in this body. That the Greek view was somewhat like her view. All reality actually is a projection of some ultra reality. 
For Plato, it was the substance versus the form. And everything you see in the world is the form. There's a substance behind it somewhere. You know, what that is, how he really understood it, who knows. But there was this underlying reality to what you what appeared to you, what you felt and smelled and touched and saw and heard. Uh, and they were well, two separate things. And the reality could exist without the form because it existed before the form. And for the Greeks, we were fundamentally spirit beings like she believes, like Joseph Smith believes. When, I'm not sure what their understanding was if they ever express it to where, whether we were always eternal, whether we were eternal and therefore always, or whether we came into existence when we were born. But when we died, their Hades was the place of the dead, the dead spirits who finally were free from this body of sickness and injury and limitation. And consequently, when Paul preaches in Athens that God has proved that he's going to start judging people by raising the, the judge from the dead, they laughed at him. You're going to be crazy, man. Who would want to be raised? I want to get rid of this. I want to be free. Because I don't need this. But you see, in the biblical view, whatever this spiritual identity is, however, quote, conscience, conscious it might be, it's helpless. It can't do anything because it doesn't have a body. You do everything with your body. Where, where is that part that Paul says that? It's in Acts 17. Acts 17. Uh-huh. See, it's a sermon where he says, uh, uh, we were viewing the town and we saw all these uh, statues to the gods. And, and you even got one that says to the God we don't know about. In case we missed one, hey, here, here's to you. So let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about the God that you suspect, <laughs> but you don't know. And his closing to the sermon is, now all this foolishness God's winked at in the past, but now he's insisting that everybody everywhere ought to repent. They need to change their mind. They need to get their heads screwed on right. They need to come to the truth from the error of their imaginations. And God has demonstrated the fact that he's proceeding to do this because the man he's put in charge of Judgment Day, he raised him from the dead. What is their ideas about death? I mean, uh, I've always thought you know, that God knows who <coughs> created and knows what we're leaving. And he knows the number of hair on the head and all that. So what I was saying is, what is her idea then? Like, I guess you just you just die. I mean, there's you're, anything. You're you finally come to understand. How can you understand if you're in a car wreck or something? What I'm saying is, that it looks like there has to be a God in control. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what she does with death in those kind of circumstances. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, well, particularly back in those days. Yeah. The vast majority of us died from very clear cause of some kind or another. We got, we got, we got badly injured um, or we got real sick and we died. 
there were, you know, there were a significant number of people who survived into their 60s and even into their 70s, yeah. but not not any large number. But they were they were around. There were people who knew that, and people who then quietly just stopped breathing one night in their sleep, or like my grandfather. Is just stop breathing in his rocking chair. He was just sitting there in his rocking chair. He'd sat down from working out in the yard or the field somewhere and came in. He sat down and I think he, they even said he lit his pipe and was sitting there rocking his chair. And his wife uh, finally realized the chair had stopped rocking and she wondered why he'd stopped rocking. And when she looked over there, why it was clear, he was dead. Well, very quiet, very like peaceful. He would have chose that. It has to be something going on. Uh, you know, God to take him, not what she's saying, because she's yeah. like, well, I guess it's time to go now. I'll just take it up over my time. <laughs> and I, I, it's crazy. I haven't seen in this in my readings here how she deals with death yet. I, I've been looking for that. <laughs> when I find it, I'll let you know. If she discusses that. I guess she didn't know about any modern medicine. She didn't be able to look into that. <laughs> Well, I thought this was. Oh yeah, she she enjoyed poor health uh, for a long time, which is one of the. Uh, well, I thought there was going to. I thought there was. This was the Wikipedia, and there was a, a thing right at the very beginning that had her death, but I don't see it. Uh, not very many. There were some on the West Coast that were brought in for the building of the railroad that were allowed to come in in the building of the railroad from the West Side to the East. But shortly after the railroad got finished, there was a pretty strong reaction against that. And so we had legislation, I think before 1900, that excluded the, excluded the Asians from immigration to the states. And we cut them off pretty early and we kept them out for a long, long time. Uh, so on, on the West Coast, you had some, and of course, all over the country, especially on the coast, you would have people who, uh, individuals with great a daring uh, initiative and so forth, who would find their way here. Uh, just like we don't hear about the Muslims, but they were here in revolutionary days. They were here in the Revolutionary War. But those uh, Chinese, they would use the opium. Oh, yeah. Or the bed. Well, I'm not sure how much they did early, because you see, the real use of opium even in the Orient, doesn't come about till the British step in and make that a real trade item. But there is a lot of medicine. But is there anything I've heard and I've read? I've read back in those days that the that they would put uh, the opium in the water and the Yeah. That they would have like a little, you know, like whatever little store or whatever. And they would burn the opium in there. And when women, you know, they were more delicate with their brain, that they would go in there and the opium <laughs> would, would, 
which is only a form of human belief. And you learn the meaning of God or good and the nature of the immutable and the immortal. Now you see, in spite of the statement at the beginning, we acknowledge and adore the one true God. You constantly have this kind of conflation. And the far more common conflation in Christian science is God and love. That almost sounds like a knowledge body and spirit. Of course. And you see, part of what's going on here is this is a solution to theodicy. <clears throat> This is a solution to that perennial problem of biblical faith, Old Testament and New Testament. How do you believe in a righteous, good, loving God in the face of all the bad, wicked, evil, destructive, oppression, death, that exists in the world. Okay. If God is good, then he owes a whole lot of us an apology for letting us be hurt in the multitude of ways that we are hurt. But we're and well, see, the classic Christian reply to that is, this isn't God's world. This is the world that God gave up on because of us. We refused to acknowledge him as God. And so he gave us up. He said, okay. Okay. Yeah, so. you, you, you don't want me to be your God? Fine. Be your own God. Do your own thing. Do what you want to do. You know, that works yeah. And you see, for all human evil, that works. You still have the problem, though, of all the natural evil. The volcanoes, the vol hurricanes, the Floods, the locusts, you don't solve that. But all human evil, you can solve easily by saying, this isn't God's choice. God's doing the best he can, given the fact that he put us on this world and said, take care of it. And when we said, no, we'd rather do it our way than your way, he said, okay, help yourself. Until one day, he said, you know, I really would like to have a few friends. And so he called Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Israel. And then he said, in order to really get them back, I'm going to have to send my son. And so he sent his son to be able to reclaim at least some of us. Uh, 
What do they think about like Now, you see, if God is love, mm -hmm. how do you define, how, if, if love is the ultimate reality, the ultimate mind, the ultimate idea, then how do you have all this evil? And the answer is, you don't. You just think you do. So they don't believe really like a Satan or like no, a no, no, like no. that. No. It's, it's because, it, yeah, it's because you allowed yourself by your culture to get your mind encapsulated by these ideas that there is pain and sickness and death and wickedness. And it's, it's all in your mind. And if you would draw close to God, and you can do that through Jesus, because he's the ultimate, the best example we have of God, of love, of human care. If you would get your, if you would take on the mind of Christ, she quotes right out of Philippians, then you would realize, oh, I don't hurt. The Lord's redeemed me from that. The Lord saved me from that. That's that's just that's just in my old unredeemed, unsaved mind. And all I have to do is cleanse my mind. All I have to do is align my thoughts with God. Before that change is all in your mind. Yeah. But that that's like some of them believing you know, laying hands on and healing and all that. That doesn't always look the same, doesn't it? Well, yes, sir. Yes, and it could. But 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 it wouldn't have to. But it creates the same kind of problem that you have with all the faith healers. If this is strictly a my matter of mind. Well, then why is she sick all the time? Yeah, but some of them, they don't say exactly what she does. So say, for instance, someone goes out and she kills somebody with the hatchet and kills them. Okay. Then what they say, what she's trying to say is he didn't have God and he's not close to him and all that. But other people say, well, he's, he's uh, the devil or Satan. Yeah. So it's probably the same thing. Yes. Like to me, she just said in a different way. You have a different you have a different initial cause, but you have the same result. Well, the same cause, I think, is that and, God. That's the cause. Yeah. And if a guy that, that did something like that, I don't think he's very close to God. So what she's saying if he was, he wouldn't be out. Well, except that you have this you have this strange bent of human history, which has demonstrated over and over and over again, you can have very, very thoughtful, caring, principled people who do terrible things. Or at least pass on ignore bad things. The classic Christian response to that, of course, is that's just how terrible we are. We, we human beings are so out of touch with the nature, the character, the quality of God that the reality is that even the best of us yeah. can do some really, really bad things. So even though that I go to church every Sunday and I'm a good Christian, but it's my constitutional right to carry my AR-15. Yes. And uh, all of a sudden I fly off the deck and, well, you know, but, you know, I got me 75 of them. Yeah. But, or at the opposite end, to be this good, upstanding, thoughtful, caring, moral Christian, and I buy and sell slaves. And what? I buy and sell slaves. 
position of the Amish or the Quaker uh, who, believe, who believe that if you really trust God, you will not have to curse your enemy, let alone kill him. That you can live in peace even in the midst of great oppression, you don't have to lose yourself if you're willing to trust God. Take him at his word and just act accordingly. And his spirit can empower you to do that with peace and even joy. So that when they left the Sanhedrin, having been given stripes, they leave rejoicing they can suffer in the name of Jesus. You didn't have to be in a convent nowadays. You didn't have to be out on the working farm with the Mennonites and things like that. Because if you're in. Oh, I don't know. Every day, if you're in a convent, you're not going to be in a convent. I don't know. Every day. There are people who seem to be able to do that. And that's good. But also, with our society, like if you don't go. Disturb this, well, oh, the father will put you in jail. You know, there's things like that. Yeah. So the question is ultimately, what is your understanding of the nature, the character of God? And how completely can you depend upon that? Do you depend upon that to shape your life? Your thoughts, your decisions, and you see, you don't have to go very far that direction. It's all in your mind. It's all until you're hey. and Eddie's <laughs> sitting over here and saying, "Didn't I tell you that? Isn't that what I told you? Isn't that what I wrote about?" Uh, <laughs> okay, that's Christian science. Let's take its modern uh, uh, w title counterpart, although they're not anywhere close th philosophically, and next week take a look at Scientology. Science. Scientology. Scientology. Yeah. That's a organized that's an organized recognized religious group in America. And see they They use in the same terminology in their title at least yeah. science is there just like in Christian science and and of course the negative judgment is in neither case are either one of them close to what is science the reason they said science I guess is because we've been talking about that uh, Her Herbert or Herbert that started it you know I think he was more into like uh, UFOs and all that kind of thing. So like Smith, you know, those are the Mormons, but he had all these followers. So this is a newer group, you know, this is what, the 60s maybe? Yeah. And he started it? Yeah. And, and also, I'll just come to us and it's an LA. <laughs> not no more. Not no more, it's not just there, but okay. That's what we look at next week. Scientology. Scientology. Uh, I'll send you some material. So what? She she died at eighty nine. She died at eighty nine. Yeah. When did she die? Eighty nine. She said. Uh, she died in nineteen ten. 
1910? Yeah. So she, she lived many years. Thank <laughs> you.